managed to stay awake for the afternoon session. I think as as for the in this as for this morning as as we did this morning, I think we have a very interesting set of questions, and we're going to follow the same format. We will have a designated hitter to lead off the uh, discussion for each question, and then um, after the first couple of questions, we'll open the floor for discussion, and then come back and have some more. Uh, discuss, question, uh, re discussion by the panel and then open it up again and then have some concluding remarks. Um, I forgot to mention earlier in the, among the handouts you have in addition to the agenda and the bios, there's also a sheet with um, a, a packet of three sheets with information about the systems of higher education in the United States, Korea and Japan. So for those of you who may not have, uh, know, you know, know a lot about the um, specifics of these different systems, uh, this might be helpful to you. If you don't have one, there's some more outside, so please help yourself. And also, this um, uh, conference is being podcast, and it will be available on the website after, uh, I think it should be up the next day or so. So if you've missed anything or you have to leave early or whatever, you could, or you want to tell colleagues about it, uh, please direct them to the, to the Wilson Center website and you can find this. Okay, well, you've met our participants, so you know who they are and what their expertise is. Um, and so um, we will get underway with our next set of questions. Um, we, this morning we talked about the challenges that are uh, being, that universities are facing now and what we, we're, we're going to try to do um, in the, this afternoon is to gaze into our crystal balls and try to think about what universities of the future may look like. On the one hand, this is a very difficult exercise because, of course, it's difficult to predict. But on the other hand, it gives us a lot of freedom, the freedom to imagine what universities might look like. It would perhaps uh, give us a chance to articulate um, aspirations, if not necessarily reality. So this is maybe not so much an exercise in prediction as an aspiration. So uh, we'll start out with uh, asking Dr. Duderstadt, will universities of the future remain essentially what they are today? I think you already know my answer to that, but let me kind of <laughs> give you some examples of what might happen. Uh, okay, um, well this moves into the conjecturing phase. I'm one of those people who believe that while universities have lasted uh, centuries, uh, they also do tend to change. And so let me give you some examples of what could happen. As I said earlier, just the f skimming through two centuries of the existence of my own institution indicate at least in terms of uh, images how the campus has changed. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is discuss three possible paradigms and then uh, something cosmic. Uh, lifelong learning we've talked about earlier, uh, lengthening lifespans, but more than that, uh, lengthening careers, perhaps by 20 to 30 years. But we also have to recognize the increasing pace of knowledge creation. Uh, my field, my background is engineering, and the tragedy is that uh, we always have to inform students entering undergraduate engineering programs that most of what we teach them will be obsolete by the time they graduate. Uh, and that characterizes many professions in this uh, global knowledge economy. Uh, one of the recommendations of the uh, Spellings Commission uh, was that the nation should accept its responsibility as a democratic society in an ever more competitive global knowledge-driven economy to provide all of its citizens with the education, training, and learning opportunities they need throughout their lives whenever, uh, wherever, and however they need it at high quality and affordable costs. Uh, essentially as a civil right, uh, much as health care is, thereby enabling both individuals and the nation itself to prosper. Now, if you go to uh, Google and, or, and punch in lifelong learning, you'll find that there are several dozen nations that are trying to approach this. None of them really know how to do it yet, but I think this is the reality. Establishing as a national goal university access to lifelong learning is a major paradigm shift. Uh, it would require transformation and expansion of the existing post-secondary education enterprise, entirely new paradigms for the conduct, financing, leadership, organization, and governance of higher education. And we talked about some of that this morning, uh, the different needs and expectations of adult learners, uh, how you finance it, uh, uh, whether you need to go to some completely different kind of way, and the way that 
Uh, most of our traditional uh, institutions are really uh, built and organized to educate the young. Uh, in reality, in a lifelong learning environment, uh, most learners will be adults. Second issue, the global university. Um, we see that mature and developing nations around the world are making major investments in building knowledge infrastructure. Uh, schools, universities, research institutes, high-tech industry, cyber infrastructure, public policies, programs, which they view as necessary to achieve prosperity and security. Uh, higher education uh, has always been international. Students move back and forth uh, to pursue education. Uh, as do faculty increasingly, uh, and of course knowledge flows quite freely around the world, particularly in an environment in which open innovation becomes uh, the key to the way that we develop and put into the economy new knowledge. But beyond that, there is a sense uh, that higher education may also be in the early stages of what you might call globalization, which is something quite different than international uh, relationships. Uh, with perhaps the emergence of truly global universities that uh, intend to compete in the global marketplace for students, faculty, and resources, but beyond that begin to define themselves in that way. Uh, we had a major conference in Switzerland a couple of years ago where we invited uh, the leaders of uh, a couple of dozen universities around the world together for several days of discussion. And the term universities of and in the world began to emerge. That is, universities that not only address the opportunities provided by the global marketplace, but begin to define their public purpose beyond institutional, regional, or national needs, and to focus on global imperatives, global sustainability, world health, wealth disparities and poverty, international development, and so forth. Uh, in the way uh, the for-profit sector has moved most rapidly toward this, usually through merger and acquisition, uh, I suppose Laureate was one of the first. Uh, apparently the Apollo Group uh, uh, is moving in this direction as well. Um, consortia of universities, uh, Universitat 21 was an example of an early stage. Uh, in this country, uh, some universities are having a very deep discussion about whether this is their future. I think of MIT in which um, the, uh, they have a very high international content of faculty and students. The MIT Open Courseware Initiative has established a brand name on the global level. And so this is a part of their, their discussion. The Meta University. Uh, one of the buzzwords that is used in the scientific community in North America these days is cyber infrastructure. This is the term used to describe hardware, software, people, organizations, and policies information, communications, technology. In the Europeans, they call it e-science. Well, the reality is in the scientific community a recognition that a second revolution in information technology is occurring that will usher in new technological age that will dwarf in sheer transformational, transformational scope and power anything we've yet experienced. Uh, cyber infrastructure has the ability to create uh, not only uh, knowledge, but you can actually create uh, environments uh, uh, that heretofore had been primarily existed in the physical domain uh, in, in cyberspace. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the core competences of universities are to provide access to knowledge, uh, to create learning communities, and to validate that learning has occurred. And all three are being transformed by uh, this technology. Let me give you some examples. Uh, uh, one of the most interesting things that's happened in recent years is to apply the philosophy of open sourceware develop, open source software development, uh, think Linux, uh, to education, uh, extending the philosophy by, of open source software by opening up opportunities for learning and scholarship to the world by putting previously restricted knowledge into the public domain and then inviting others to join in its use and development. So open source, open content, open learning. Uh, there are a lot of things going on. The Open Courseware Initiative launched by MIT. Uh, I don't know how many of you check iTunes U every once in a while at the iTunes store for Apple, but you want to sit in on the top 30 courses that Yale offers in high quality video, they're there. You'd rather have Oxford or Cambridge, they're there. Uh, so it's the Stanford physics curriculum, it's there. Uh, open knowledge management, these are open source tools to manage the learning environment. Uh, virtual organizations, Wikipedia, uh, open education resource providers like Rice's Connections program, open content, which I'll go to in just a moment, 
and open participatory learning, the wiki process, blogs and so forth. Let me give you an example, the Google Books Library Project. Uh, Larry Page, one of the founders of Google, was in fact an undergraduate at Michigan during the uh, mid-1990s. And while he was at Michigan, he worked on an NSF project to create a digital library. And so we were not too surprised when he came back to us in 2004 and said, why don't you let us try to digitize your library? Our library has eight million volumes in it, and our estimate at the time was it would be billions of dollars to do that. But uh, the university and its wisdom said, Google, you can go ahead and try. Uh, what started off as five libraries, Stanford, Michigan, the New York Public Library, Oxford, one other, I think part of Harvard, uh, is at least the, the, the G30 right now, uh, whose combined collections are estimated to be over half of the estimated number of books in the world today in 400 languages. Uh, Google's scanning of Michigan's 7.8 million volume library uh, this number is out of date. Uh, they expect to finish this next year. I might add that Google's goal is 30 million unique titles, which is what librarians tell me is roughly the number of unique books uh, is estimated to exist in the world today. So this is a rather ambitious program. Uh, now, <clears throat> what is not so generally known is that Google is scanning all of this to make it available for full text searches, which they'll put their little advertisements on and make money but they uh, provide the digital copy of what they scan to the host institution, um, and that is available for the host institution in ways that they see fit, appropriate, and legal. Uh, so what has happened is a number of institutions, uh, the institutions, public universities of the Midwest, the Big Ten, plus Stanford, University of California, have created something called the Hathi Trust, which my colleagues tell me that Hathi means elephant in Hindi. Uh, it's currently at about five and a half million volumes, and what their goal is is different. It's to put as much of this in terms of full text, open content access into the public domain as possible. As it stands today, any material that's been digitized that's uh, older than Mickey Mouse, he was born in 1923, uh, is acceptable in copyright to put on the web, and it's all available to you just as, as soon as it's scanned and cataloged. So the question is what to do beyond that. Um, orphan works in which the author is uh, dead and the publisher is out of business. Who owns it? Well, maybe you can put that on. That's a lot of scholarly material, I might add, most of what's in libraries. Uh, fair use. Uh, we toyed at one time at taking an 8 million volume library and putting it uh, into the uh, domain uh, umich.edu, which was our, our uh, domain. Uh, we were certain we'd get sued for that, but <laughs> and I think that went off the drawing boards as a possibility. Social networking, yet another application. Instant messaging, Facebook, Twitter, virtual environments, uh, Second Life, immersive games. The world of Warcraft is probably the best business education you can get these days, uh, where you have to learn how to be an apprentice and select teams and manage things and so forth. Simulation, uh, immersive simulation. Uh, think Avatar, uh, or if you're a science fiction buff, think Ender's Game, uh, where uh, tacit knowledge is learned through actual simulation. Uh, Chuck Vest rolled all of the, the former president of MIT, uh, rolled all of this together in what he called the Meta University. Open source, open content, open learning, uh, other open technologies along with cyber infrastructure uh, become the scaffolding on which to build true global universities uh, with cyber infrastructure providing the technology uh, and the open philosophy, opening it up to allow its distribution uh, of knowledge and learning opportunities to the world. So imagine what happens if you could put all of this together. Uh, today, The Economist estimates there are about three and a half billion cell phone contracts in the world. Now, a lot of people may have dozens of cell phones in their drawer or something. Uh, but the point is that within the next decade, the majority of the world's population will have connectivity at the 3, 3G, 4G uh, level. A billion right now have broadband, uh, faster than in the United States for most of our people. So you have a connected world, open source knowledge and uh, open content distribution rather through library digitization. Uh, most of the printed material of the world has been digitized and is searchable. Uh, the courts uh, in litigation will decide how much of that becomes available. Uh, 
open source knowledge and learning software, uh, primitive tools right now, but we've heard uh, Phoenix is moving rapidly down the road to make these more and more efficient. Uh, immersive envir environments and simulation, um, that's increasingly how a lot of these, these young people learn. Uh, and all of this is built on a substrate of this cyber infrastructure that continues to evolve at a rate of a hundred to a thousand times a decade. Uh, sometimes you might want to just write down on a piece of paper how much memory your personal computer had in 1980, 1990, year 2000, and 2010, and you'll see that number's about right. Um, so imagine a world at a time in the near future, certainly within the lives of our students and I think more likely within the lives of everybody, most people at least in this room, some of us accepted, of course, <clears throat> a time in the near future when anyone with even a modest internet connection has access to all of the recorded knowledge of human history along with ubiquitous learning opportunities. Further, <clears throat> the linking together a substantial part of the world's population with limitless access to knowledge and learning opportunities, all on this technology that's it's increasing a thousandfold in power every decade. Uh, what is this? Uh, well, I was involved in a project in the 1980s to couple together scientists with the nation's supercomputer, which we, uh, my institution participated in with IBM, which evolved into something called the Internetwork, and they later shortened it to call it the Internet. And we were involved in that project in the 1980s. We couldn't imagine anything that this would be useful for beyond science. Uh, we certainly couldn't have imagined the spontaneous emergence of things like Amazon or um, uh, Google or Twitter. <laughs> uh, that's the kind of environment we're going we're gonna to find ourselves with, a new form of collective human intelligence as billions of world citizens interact together unconstrained by today's monopolies on knowledge or learning opportunities. And so maybe this is the most exciting vision for the future of the university. Uh, no longer constrained by space, time, monopoly, archaic laws, but unleashed by this technology to empower the emergence of a new global situation, uh, civilization of humankind. That's really scary to universities, but that's the kind of thing that students entering our campuses today are thinking about. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other uh, members of the panel want to jump in on this? What will Will universities of the future, anybody want to say that universities are going to remain you know, essentially the same? <laughs> no, no other Luddites in the room. Uh, but other, other people have other visions they want to articulate? Okay, well, we'll move on to the next question, which is one of great importance to me as a, hum, as a historian, and that is what will be the place <laughs> of the humanities and the social sciences um, in, this, in these universities of the future? Dr. Kawadu, do you want to uh, Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Actually, I, I don't understand what the <laughs> meaning of the, of the question. Uh, if uh, this question means that the, the humanities and social sciences might uh, play a lesser role in the industry of the future, I don't think that. Uh, I believe uh, humanities and social sciences must play a more important role in universities of the future. The first one, uh, uh, in, the, in the liberal arts level, uh, of course, uh, uh, humanities and social sciences are uh, so important. Uh, so uh, we, we educate, we must educate young people uh, to think about what is the human beings, uh, what what the uh, what is society, uh, what uh, the human being should be, what the uh, society should be. The, the, these uh, all people must think about that. How to educate such uh, such uh, big issues? That's uh, uh, we in this education uh, we need, of course, uh, the uh, histories of humanities and social science theories. This is no, no problem. And also, the second level, in the professional education, we need also our humanities and social sciences. And, and uh, recently, Japan and Korea have introduced uh, law schools from the American model. But uh, uh, formerly, uh, Japan and Korea 
in, in Japan and Korea, lawyers uh, get their qualification just through examination. But now, universities uh, cultivate the lawyers. That is a very dramatic change to, to our society. Uh, this is, um, uh, we have a uh, uh, graduate school, Applied Human Sciences. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, successful graduate school of humanity area. Uh, we, uh, in this school, uh, the consultant should be created through uh, psychology and sociology and uh, pedagogy. Um, and also, uh, recently, the uh, Demo democratic government in Japan announced that they will introduce a new system for teachers' uh, school uh, because uh, to improve uh, teachers' quality, uh, we need more education for teachers. That is a uh, uh, graduate school for teachers' college. That is, uh, in, in this way, the many, many areas we need more uh, humanity and social science for uh, advanced professional uh, education. And thirdly, of course, uh, in the research area, uh, the research of humanities and social sciences should be uh, developed in university of the future. I don't know uh, uh, humanities uh, so much in, in but in, in my uh, area, uh, economics, economic theories, uh, after Riemann shock, we need more new theory of economics. And now the very controversial uh, times in this area. So we, uh, that's uh, an university's role, I think, I believe. And also, uh, uh, Dr. Didastat told before, uh, lifelong education, uh, lifelong education. Of course, in, in, uh, in this uh, uh, in, uh, lifelong education, many areas must be humanities and social sciences. So in, in such a, a personal education, or uh, even liberal arts education, uh, that's uh, lifelong education needs these areas. That is my opinion. Could I just um, push you a little bit? In the last session, you said that you thought universities had to be training students for global citizenship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you say a little bit more about what that, how that would be different from, I mean, universities now train people for citizen, for national citizenship, but how yes. would training for global citizenship be different, okay. do you think? Uh, of course, uh, the first, uh, first issue must be the, uh, some uh, global, uh, we, we should educate uh, students about uh, global issues uh, such as uh, environment issues and human rights issues and peace. And also, Im the important point is uh, just, just not for, not, just not educate uh, knowledge, but also to understanding the, the uh, uh, so-called how to say, and uh, uh, diversity of the culture. <laughs> that is, uh, 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 the Japanese students must understand Korean and Chinese cultures and also the Western culture. That we uh, the young people should uh, understand each other because uh, uh, through the uh, that's a liberal arts education. That is our uh, uh, trial in this universe, in, in our university. We, this uh, uh, one important uh, reason to uh, accept uh, uh, foreign students or send our uh, students to foreign country. They must. Uh, not for just uh, language education, language learning, but also they need to uh, other culture who, who, who don't know in, in, in the home countries. That is uh, my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
would, Mr. Matsura, would you want to jump in on this? You've been thinking a lot about education in a global context. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, I definitely agree with the general assessment of the place of the humanities and social sciences in education presented by Dr. Kawaguchi. Uh, I would like to look at the issue from the other side, uh, namely you know, the natural sciences. Uh, you know, you know, one of the worries that you know, UNESCO has in recent years is young people or university students in particular uh, don't like to major in natural sciences, believing that that is something very complex, very complicated. Uh, in which no, they don't like to en engage. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the overall number of uh, uh, students measuring in the natural sciences is uh, declining uh, all over the world. In Japan, you know, traditionally, you know, uh, we had you know, more uh, students measuring in natural sciences than in the <coughs> humanities. Uh, it's the same, namely the uh, new trend is uh, more students uh, measuring in humanities, abandoning uh, all uh, natural uh, science. I'm not arguing you know, uh, uh, that is regrettable that many young people want to study the humanities. That is a good you know, uh, development, but I'm arguing uh, we must have the right balance between these two areas. We have to have uh, uh, a number of young people uh, pursuing you know, uh, studies in natural sciences, measuring in natural sciences, you know, becoming uh, scientists in, in uh, future. We, you, uh, we have to have the right balance. You know, what worries uh, me these days is uh, that balance you know, uh, is you know, uh, uh, being destroyed in favor of the humanity and the social uh, sciences. Uh, though the latter uh, is always a very important area, nevertheless, you know, we must you know, pay attention. We must uh, uh, try to get more young students uh, to measure in uh, natural sciences. This is the other side of the uh, coin which you know, uh, Dr. Kawuchi has uh, presented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments mm -hmm. from the panel on the humanities as a former classicist <laughs> or still uh, still a classicist mm -hmm. <coughs> recovering yeah recovering. <laughs> <coughs> well I I think one of the issues will will be how we as, as humanities and social science scholars can work to better integrate I mean, we, we have seen over the, you know, the, the, the tradition has been that they are separate. <clears throat> it's sort of like in medical school where you go to in, in the first year, you do nothing but chemistry, and, and then you, you apply it later. Uh, that model of medical education is now being challenged in, in the United States. And I think if we look at keeping humanities and social sciences separate from the rest of the curriculum, I think uh, that's probably ultimately not going to be uh, the best way that those disciplines will continue to advance. I think we need to, to continue to look at ways of, uh, of integrating them throughout the curriculum. So do you see new disciplines emerging or interdisciplines like science studies or something like that? No, I think it's, it's almost more of, of a recognition that, uh, that history and art and psychology are, are all part of one life experience. I don't know that they have to be pulled apart, but they can simply be, um, be integrated without, without trying to reinvent them, I think. Can I have one? Sure. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a research project of digital humanities. Mm -hmm. That is very important, just uh, your, your talk about. But this is not only the scan of the uh, letters and materials, but also the uh, uh, heritage of uh, uh, picture and, <laughs> and uh, also uh, some uh, literature. Uh, literature, uh, no, no, of course, literature and uh, some uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, 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 pottery and wheels and everything. Every uh, 
uh, our heritage can be digitalized and everyone all over the world can look at mm -hmm. that is um, how to uh, do that that is our uh, research project this is a very important thing to uh, computer science and uh, humanities uh, uh, in the discipline mm -hmm. this is about one, one project yeah. That sounds very, very exciting. Um, we're going to do one more question, and then we'll open it up. And so the third question that uh, we wanted this panel to deal with is, will universities dis disappear as formal tertiary education in recognition of the diversity of learning styles and needs? And we're going to turn to John King for that. <clears throat> well, um, the best information I ever got from courses in organizational behavior was the best predictor of how long an organization is going to be around is how long it's been around. And uh, that's remained pretty true. Uh, universities are very long-lived entities. Um, Jim was talking about the Google uh, Book Project at Michigan. The position that we took at Michigan on the Google Book Project was, we'll be around long after Google is gone. And uh, we're in the business of preserving knowledge. And they're not. Um, in fact, the publishers aren't in the business of preserving the stuff that they themselves published. Uh, we do that. They come to us to get copies of what they originally created because they no longer have it. And sometimes they don't have it even though it's only five or ten years old. Um, so, you know, the university has an important conservatory role, which is going to remain. Uh, and um, there's also a very deep lore that goes with the university, and it's, it's, it's easy to overlook. Um, some years ago, I was on a flight from Europe to Detroit. Uh, this was around 2003, 2004. And this was when uh, uh, Daimler and, and Chrysler were still together. And I happened to be sitting next to a high-ranking uh, executive in Daimler Chrysler. And then we were talking about the automobile industry because I was doing some studies of the automobile industry at that time. And I, uh, I asked him, so what's, what's going to happen to the auto industry in Detroit? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, is Detroit going to remain an automobile city? And he said, look, it's real simple. There are three global centers for automobiles. There's Tokyo Nagoya, there's Stuttgart Munich, and there's Detroit. And there won't be four, and there won't be two. And I thought, well, that's pretty bold. But it's true. Uh, at least up to this point, I mean, with all the trouble that the automobile industry is facing and all the trouble that's in Detroit, um, in the auto American automobile industry in particular, uh, the automobile industry for the Western Hemisphere is in Detroit. It is not going to be anywhere else. And that's because the know-how to do automobiles is in Detroit. It's not in Memphis. It's not in Sao Paulo. It's in Detroit. Just like the knowledge about how to do integrated circuits is in Silicon Valley. And there are lots of places around the world that have tried to build this capability, and they failed. They, they can't displace these existing centers because that knowledge goes too deep in, in those existing centers. So I guess my point in this is that uh, these institutions, some of which are, are hundreds of years old, um, many of which are uh, bordering a thousand years, are uh, deeply planted social institutions that cannot be moved simply because somebody decides they have a better way. Now, I talked earlier about the rise of cellular telephony and communications technologies. Here's an interesting fact about communication technologies that's relevant to this study. Very few communications technologies are ever completely displaced. So, for example, um, Morse code and, uh, and teletype. Uh, you don't see it much anymore, but a major mode of background knowledge transmission is radio teletype. Uh, if you turn on the shortwave band, if you have a shortwave receiver, you can hear radio teletype being used as, as a communications medium. It's very inexpensive for certain kinds of communication transmission, and it's very heavily in use. It's not the primary way that we communicate like we used to with telegraphy uh, in the you know, late part of the, uh, of the 19th century before telephony displaced the, the primary use of telegraphy, um, we still use radio, even though television came along. We still have cinema, even though television came along. 
the internet has not displaced um, many other forms of communication. It's, it's augmented them. So I think what we're likely to see as a result of this increasing diversity, and coming back to the question about what's going to happen, is we're going to add to rather than displace the array of things that we have in tertiary education. Now, some of that addition is going to be in traditional existing universities. There will be changes in those institutions. It's already happening. Uh, in some cases, it's the rise of new kinds of institutional enterprises. University of Phoenix, for-profit higher education sector in the United States is a really good example of that. It's one of the fastest growing uh, parts of, of U.S. higher education. Um, that's stepping in to, to change the way things happen uh, as universities become more interested in their bottom line over the long run. This comes back to Jim Duderstadt's point earlier about faculty members being very entrepreneurial. I think you'll see more institutions of higher education taking a, a broader look at the portfolio of things they offer. And I think in some cases, and this is a prediction I'll make about University of Michigan and Ann Arbor, um, there will be a return to some of the things that historically we were very strong at and that we charged a premium price for because they continue to command a premium price and people are willing to pay that because they get something special for it, something they can't get, for example, at the University of Phoenix because that's not the kind of thing the University of Phoenix offers. So um, my, my prediction for the future of higher education is there's going to be more and more heterogeneous flavors of higher education, tertiary education, extending into this lifelong, life-wide learning space. Uh, but you're going to find that many of the traditional providers are still present in that space. They're not going to be wiped out. They're not going to be displaced. Uh, in many cases, they're doing things that the society doesn't have any other means for. So to take a case in point, the state of Michigan has decided to stop keeping track of its own records. Now, the French sort of figured out a long time ago, you really can't have a state without state archives. Uh, the Romans kind of got that too. Um, the state of Michigan's view is, I think, that the University of Michigan should pay for that. Um, and, you know, we sort of have been. But we won't do it indefinitely. There's going to have to be some new social organization of the state archive. I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but it will happen. The state can't push that off on us and just make us pay for it because we're not the primary beneficiaries of that. Um, I guess the, the final thing I'll say is that um, the big challenge in my mind for the traditional form of higher education in this country is it's predicated on a public good model. And higher education in the United States is now fundamentally a private good. And most of the apparatus that we have to administer traditional higher, higher education is built around a public goods concept that doesn't work very well in a private goods era. And so this is probably the most wrenching change that we're undergoing right now. We're going to have to have a new kind of fundamental economic model. The, the, the economic model of public goods, actually, bro broadly speaking, public goods in the United States is, is crippled, badly crippled right now, and probably won't survive in the form that we used to know it. And we're going to have to come up with new ways of doing things that, that replace that, that substitute for that. Uh, and continue this set of missions that we, we won't stop doing. It's, it's like infrastructure. Only the most important things in society make it to infrastructure status. And higher education is, and tertiary education is a form of social infrastructure. Do you think that the, um, the kinds of things that, that uh, Dr. Duderstadt was talking about, the existence of open courseware, that sort of thing, is that lowering the cost of education so that maybe we can preserve the notion of pri public goods? It's alter, in, in my view, it's altering the marginal cost of, of learning. Um, and I think that this is the important thing. I mean, right, historically, we've had what amounted to, in effect, an average cost pricing model for higher education. And that's unsustainable if you want to extend access. Uh, you, you just can't afford to do it because there's too many people who can't pay that, and the society won't pay it. The society will not pay for the level of access that the society says it wants for higher education. In the state of Michigan, the Cherry Commission in 2004, uh, Lieutenant Governor Cherry uh, chaired a commission at the request of the governor on the future of higher education in the state of Michigan. Uh, they came out with this pronouncement that said, within 10 years, 
all citizens of the state of Michigan should be engaged in higher education in some way. And in the meantime, they've cut our budget by 200 and some million dollars. Um, they're cutting the state's uh, higher education budget across the board by equivalent amounts, proportional amounts. Um, there's no question that we're not going to make that target by 20, 2014. Uh, we're not going to make it at all under a linear speed up model. We're going to have to find a much different um, uh, economic model for this. And, and I think things like open courseware and so forth will matter. And I guess the, the final thing I'll say is that when you're dealing with, um, with something of value like knowledge, which lacks what economists call super additivity, that is, you can, you can give it away to everybody and you still have it. Right? That's one of the features of, of knowledge. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson's famous candle quote, you know, he who lights his candle at my candle enlightens himself without darkening me. Right? That idea. That, that's actually a multiplier, of sort of positive network externalities that happen as a result of people being able to share knowledge with one another. Um, is, is like a multiplier effect on this, uh, on this thing that uh, Jim's talking about with open courseware, open knowledge, and so forth. The IP rules are going to change. They have to change, and they're not going to go down easily because there's lots of vested interests that benefit from keeping the world strangled uh, intellectually. But, um, but, but, that, but that will eventually fall. It's, it's starting already. Great, thank you. Anybody else want to con comment on whether we're going to, whether universities will uh, disappear as formal <laughs> tertiary education? So we're one yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, what is the different difference between universities and other uh, tertiary, uh, tertiary education institutions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just point out that the University of Phoenix calls itself a university. Um, <laughs> back when uh, I was in California as a, as a college student, there were the California State Colleges mm -hmm. and the University of California. There's no such thing as California State Colleges. They're all California State Universities now. So the, mm -hmm. the answer to the question of what's the difference between a university and other forms of higher education mm -hmm. is hard to tell um, <laughs> because there's been this massive upclassing and uh, sort of marketing scheme that colleges have, have um, pursued. In fact, um, I was talking to colleagues at, at, at what used to be called Bentley College in Massachusetts, right, which is Bentley. And, and now they're Bentley University. Right. Uh, you know, I went there one year and they were Bentley College, and I went there the next year and they were Bentley University, and it kind of looked like the same place to me. Um, but, you know, another university, so they're obviously more awesome. I, but I think may, maybe the way to think about the question is, I mean, I, th I was thinking about this. We, I mean, we think about, st you know, I think that our degrees are based on kind of a life course model that's, that's changed. So, you know, there's elementary school, there's high school, and secondary, that's secondary education. And then tertiary education is BAs and BSs and then, and then postgraduate, um, you know, degrees. But if we're talking about lifelong learning, then are we going to, are we going to have more degrees in the future or are we going to just get rid of degrees because it's this long continuous process? I mean, I think maybe that's part of the question. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to get rid of majors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and right. That'll go first. Uh -huh. And eventually we'll get rid of degrees. Whether it happens before we get rid of tenure or after, I don't know. Right. But, <laughs> and uh, when are they going to get rid of the faculty? These are all in the future for us. Yeah. Yeah. And when are they going to get rid They're of the faculty? They're also in the past because Jefferson, of course, didn't want his University of Virginia to give degrees. Uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. So we're going full circle. Okay, it's time for all of you to jump in. So I see a hand right there, and Ooh. well, lots of hands. Okay, uh, this gentleman right here, who? But try, try and keep your your questions brief. I'll collect a few, and we'll answer them all. Yeah, just in relation to the last point about the the, the, the future uh, of universities. I mean, maybe uh, the answer to that lies in the past. Uh, in the history of uh, Islamic uh, universities. Most of them were uh, based on what we call waqf or endowments. And these universities which were based on waqfs survived for thousands of years like Al-Qirawan and Al-Azhar. And it is when the well, waqf is a non-government uh, institution. It is when the governments intervened like in Al-Azhar case or in the Tunisian governments that the quality of education and the credibility of the institutions 
were uh, uh, degenerated. So maybe uh, we need to look at uh, WACF as a form. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, our institution uh, just got a license for a university in Lebanon uh, that would be a WACF, an endowment. So all the resources that are put no longer belong to uh, a particular uh, individual. It's a trust. So I just want to uh, pose that as an alternative. Okay. This lady right here. And please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Rose Chen, uh, a Rose Group for Cross-Cultural Understanding. Um, I'd like the panel to address the issue about the re-emergent of uh, China and India, the two very old civilization and I see the impact in many, fo in, in many levels. I know that the, the China already have uh, uh, a lot of students coming to university here and had a great impact. And in Boston University alone, there's 1,000 Chinese students. They put, pay full tuition. So the university used that to subsidize uh, for the American students who need financial aid, that's one thing. And also, uh, we talk about internet technology is the equalizer. With a large population in China and India, the government must recognize the need to educate a huge population. And the online education, open source, so it should be very attractive to them. So I wonder if the panel has seen anything, have they grabbed the opportunity to do so? And just like the green technology, this is a new frontier. Whoever sees the opportunity would have a, a leap into the future. And on the other hand, the humanity side, uh, the, in the past few hundred years, the history, the world history, the foreign policy and what, whatever, is all looks through the Eurocentral, the lens. And China, India, and other so-called colonized country, the underdeveloped country, now the economy you know, has shifted. Would you see the shift in perspective and interpretation of the world history? Thank you. OK, we'll take one more question right back there. Uh, thanks. I'm Ben Woldovsky with the Kaufman Foundation and uh, also the author of The, the Great Brain Race, as, as my colleague mentioned. Um, a question, I guess, really for, for Jim Duderstadt in particular. This new world that you sketch out of uh, cyber universities and radically different self-directed learning, lots of technology, and of course many people talk about this. I wonder, I, I'm, not any mean, I'm not against it, but I wonder a, a lot about the role of the teacher. Um, there's something sort of the, uh, there's something fairly radical, at least from some folks, about the notion that everybody will educate themselves. There won't be any more hierarchies of learning. What do you think about the sort of old-fashioned notion that a, if not an older person, at least a wiser person, ought to be the teacher, and they should be teaching something to the less wise person? Great. Okay. Why don't we answer this round of questions? Then we'll have one more round before we go on to the next. You want me to take that one first? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the kind of medieval uh, uh, name for the university, Universitas Magistarium et Scholarium, uh, of a uh, union of masters and scholars, is still at the core of the knowledge generating university, where one generation of masters of knowledge in certain fields creates the next generation and so on. Uh, and that Universitas character will remain with and hopefully uh, is absolutely necessary uh, as a component of many universities. But many universities don't have that mission. Uh, you know, they, uh, they are not necessarily, they, they can capture knowledge that others have developed, but their role is transmitting it. And here I think other things open up. You may be aware that, that Carnegie Mellon for the last number of years, decade or more, has been running their cognitive tutor program, where the, their aim is actually to get faculty out of the classroom entirely very heavily structured, uh, interactive uh, software development, very expensive, but it's been demonstrated on multiple occasions that it does a better job than, t 
than faculty do in teaching early materials like introductory calculus and so forth and so on. So in some areas, I think uh, the faculty member will fall out of the equation and other devices will be used to educate. Uh, the second observation, uh, when MIT uh, introduced its open courseware initiative, what they found is that one of the, the early, the, one of the, the uh, uh, most robust early populations that were using it were MIT students themselves. And what they began to find are that the, the uh, uh, student attendance at lecture courses dropped off radically. And the reason for that is that at least at a place like MIT, students learn more from one another than they learn from the faculty. They found the most productive way to learn material was to form learning communities of students uh, supported by open source co uh, 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 courseware. Uh, and then to use the faculty member as essentially a consultant. So they go to class when they had questions to ask. But that, now, that may not apply to every place, but there are some examples where certain kinds of learning can occur. So my, my point is to kind of respond. I think the advancement of knowledge is still a master scholar kind of a community. Uh, but the transmission of that knowledge may not require that to the same degree. And actually, uh, one of the, uh, the business models for very large universities is that we don't use that relationship anyway at the undergraduate or the, uh, uh, the, 11, you know, the, f the first two years, we primarily use teaching assistants. Uh, and so the real university and engagement with faculty really doesn't occur until students move into, the, uh, into disciplinary concentrations. And that's, that's the same way it is in Europe, actually. You know, the, the Bologna uh, first cycle is a three-year discipline-based program because their secondary education is much more robust than ours. And that's where they have this other kind of an experience. But would you see a role still for faculty in um, determining the curriculum and, and doing the certification and so forth? Uh, I would, but I, I guess I question whether that's going to occur in all institutions or whether that pace will be set in certain institutions and adopted by others in the same way that textbooks, you know, I mean, this is, this is kind of the successor to the textbook mm -hmm. process. Uh, what's different about it, I think, is that this, this generation of young people is very much engaged in social interaction made possible by technology we couldn't have even imagine 10 to 20 years ago. And they, I mean, students bring their own university consortium to campus with them because they have study groups involving kids they went to high school with and have gone to a lot of different institutions. Mm -hmm. I shudder to think what's going to happen to our on-campus instruction when the Amazon model, Amazon.com models of having students rate this explosion of open courseware that's out there saying, you know, if you really want to learn about 19th century Japanese economic history, this is the course you go to, okay? <laughs> Don't go to this one, okay? You know, the stars. The stars, the, right, right, and, right. And right. That, that also is beginning to happen. You're beginning to see mm -hmm. that in iTunes U. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it on iPods, pants. <laughs> so... But that fundamental knowledge generating role that goes back to medieval times of masters and scholars will remain, and I think will be at the core of those institutions that have a mission of extending the knowledge base and original scholarship. Uh, anybody else want to comment on the, uh, on the shift of knowledge from your, sort of a Eurocentric to a more Asian-centric? Maybe some of our Asian colleagues have something to say about that? No? I'll make a comment about that, even though I'm not Asian. Um, no, I think that this is already pretty evident, uh, even in circles of scholarship that, that I'm familiar with in comparative studies and history and so forth, that um, there's a lot of questioning of, of the political dimensions of historical master narratives, uh, for example. So um, I've done a lot of work in the uh, Gulf states in the last few years, and uh, I found that um, reading the histories of the Gulf states that were written primarily from Islamic sources as opposed to uh, British sources, and the British documented things very thoroughly so that it was, it was easy to study uh, from the British perspective, uh, provided a radically different interpretation of the history of that region than the uh, British account did. Um, for example, the whole concept of the Barbary pirates was uh, a British fiction. Uh, there was never piracy uh, going on at the level that the British said there was. It was the British excuse for destroying the trading fleet that the uh, Oman traditionally 
uh, used to dominate Indian Ocean trade. Um, now, this isn't something that I ever heard when I was in school. This is something I read because I started looking into this later and wondering why things were the way they were there. So I, I don't think it's possible to stop that phenomenon from happening. That's actually part of, it's actually become part of the mainstream of um, criticism now to, to question those perspectives. And I think that's a, a very you know, positive thing. Um, let me make one comment about Jim's observation. There's a, a guy named Bill Ucci. He's a professor of management at UCLA. He became well known in the 1990s for publishing something called Theory Z, uh, for those of you who remember that. But um, he decided to start looking at uh, high performing public school districts in circumstances where you would expect them not to be high performing, inner city schools. And I asked him one time if there was a signature that characterized all of these very high performing public schools, uh, public school districts, and he said, oh yeah, yeah, there's one, one feature they all have in common, everybody teaches. The administrators teach, the custodians teach, school services staff, kitchen services staff teach, everybody teaches. Everybody in these districts understands their job is to teach. Now, he explained a lot more about what that meant and the details of how it got implemented, but my, my point here, and it goes back to the question about this traditional relationship between uh, faculty and students, a lot of the best students are teachers. Peer instruction is, 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 is not a, a new idea. This has been around for a long time. A lot of these technologies facilitate that. Um, it's quite amazing how many people you can learn from uh, who don't carry the word teacher attached to their name. This is probably the most promising revolution that we're going to be seeing in learning in this country in the foreseeable future. And it's going to mean, of course, the erosion of a lot of the guild status that the teaching professions have hung on to so tenaciously, and not just in K-12, trust me, it's higher education all the way up the line, tenure and everything else. Um, and I think that's, that's going to go. It, it, it's, it's, there's a better way that's emerging than that way, and it will eventually prevail. But it might take a generation or two. Um, this is a question I have for Jim Duderstadt, and this has been burning in my mind ever since I read your work online and then, and then hear you now. I understand that knowledge is exploding and that and the technologies to carry it and transmit it are exploding. But the human brain, it may be evolving, but I think we probably still have the same, pretty much the same brain capacity we ever did, or is it going to go the way, the way of the appendix? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how, how do we, um, how, how do you think about that? I mean, what, do you, how do you, what is brain science telling us about our capacity to absorb all of this knowledge and if we, if we can't, if brains can't, development can't keep up with the explosion of knowledge, then how do we think about organizing knowledge in a way that we can somehow or other comprehend it and, and can't keep control over it? So, I mean, you know, I'm sort of going to this dystopian vision of, you know, the, the robots turning on us, that kind of thing. You know, jack you into cyberspace. Right, uh, right. One of our colleagues, John knows him, Gordon Bell, has for the last two or three years been wandering around his world uh, with a camera and a uh, digital recorder attached to him 24 hours a day recording everything that he sees, <laughs> hears, and so forth. And these huge piles of memory that... Uh, that he and, can't and possibly that, ever look well, at. Look and, at and, and now Microsoft is trying to figure out what to do with this stuff, okay? Yeah. So uh, that, you know, whether there will be devices that will assist you and so forth, uh, it's hard to say. Let me let me give you a very pragmatic example of how this kind of changes the equation, particularly in the professions. Several years ago, I was asked by the National Science Foundation to essentially do what amounted to a Flexner report on my field, which is engineering. And part of the concern was the so-called uh, offshoring phenomena, the fact that uh, more and more American corporations, uh, global corporations, are penalized by Wall Street unless they offshore a certain number of their jobs to India, to uh, China, to um, uh, East uh, or Central Europe. Uh, now, although that was a price competition for a while because uh, wage rates were one-fifth that in the States and so forth, uh, it's also the case that there are very strong cultures of learning at the advanced level in many societies. I look at the Indian Institutes of Technology. Uh, which are kind of a scattered series of MITs that enroll the best and the brightest of the Indian science students. 
and they can do work at a, a level of quality that in the United States we've lost the capacity to do in many areas. And so here we have, uh, I, John and I come from a university that has 8,000 students enrolled in our College of Engineering, okay? And these students, after four years of very hard work, will get a degree in engineering uh, and will run the risk of almost immediately being put out of work in their first job as that job is offshored to India, to China, and so forth. What to do? Okay. Well, the reality is that we have to add value several times that added by people who are just as smart, work just as hard, just as dedicated, and in, in the intensity of what they learn, uh, increasingly are going to institutions that are just as good. So what's our niche in all of this? What do you tell an engineering student? Well, the reality is, that, and the, the, the torch I've been carrying for a long time, is we've got to do what was done a century ago in medicine and move it to the postgraduate level and use the undergraduate experience to provide a much broader education, giving someone the agility to continue to learn through life and so forth. Uh, I'll tell you, this is an example where uh, practices change one grave at a time because trying to get accreditation agencies and so forth to buy into this is difficult. But unfortunately, within the last decade, it's become apparent that it's not getting out ahead of the world. We're falling farther behind because in most of the world today, uh, engineering profession is taught at the graduate level. Okay, It's taught in the second cycle of the Bologna uh, cycle approach. And so, in a sense, uh, part of the challenge to the United States as these changes occur is as much a catch-up as trying to get ahead. And that's something we have to realize. I mean, the emergence of one other example. Uh, uh, there, there's a really interesting report that you might try and seek at the University of California Center for Policy and Higher Education that looked at what different nations around the world did in the financial market collapse over the last two years. Uh, China, not surprisingly, continued to invest at an increase of 10 percent a year in higher education. Most of Europe didn't cut higher education because their economies are structured different. The only nation which seriously cut higher education as the approach to handling the, uh, the damage done by the collapse of the financial markets was the United States. Okay. So there's a certain policy issue here that I think we should be attentive to. Yeah, go ahead. Just to offer one other perspective on that, um, and that is that of the student. Uh, we, we are doing extensive market research about how students learn, what their attitudes are, and they have a very interesting attitude towards uh, becoming repositories of knowledge. And the attitude, I'll just summarize it, they feel they don't need to know. They need to know where to go to get the information when they need it which is interesting because it's counter to a lot of things that, that we have done traditionally, but it's something we have to, I think, keep in mind as we go forward. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. Any, uh, yeah, I promised another round of questions. So um, where are my mic people? Uh, Clark, this woman here, right here? Hi, I'm from the National Endowment for the Arts, but I'm also a philosopher. Um, and so I have a couple of questions related to uh, visualization of knowledge and uh, sort of uh, different modes of representing other than uh, linguistic, linear, and mathematical, so um, which we use in the arts all the time, of course. Um, and I think there's a tension really between the restriction of uh, young people in public schools in this country, opportunities to kind of visualize their knowledge uh, as they're limited more and more to math and, and language arts classes. And, and yet, uh, we're, we're heading in this administration toward the college ready, so certainly you're going to have a whole host of uh, new generations of learners at universities, theoretically, if Obama is successful. Um, but, uh, but I think also when we talk about, uh, I don't know how this young generation is going to be multidisciplinary if they're really restricted to thinking um, uh, more and, and their course, their course, course load K-12 is not going to include diverse different sorts of courses, including exposure to economics and sorts of things. So I'm just curious if that's something that factors into your thinking is um, in the arts, you know, we think of audio, uh, sound design, uh, we, which has some of these things have um, engineering uh, capacities, obviously uh, visualization, rotating three-dimensional objects, um, movement and choreography. Um, and so, so these are ways that you often see someone who has a hard time with text 
Uh, we talked a lot about text, but actually um, some making sense of this knowledge uh, to some of us in creative communities is actually s sort of the, syn the synthetic part is, is perhaps like engaging with other modes of, of uh, visualizing uh, knowledge and representing the world, like representing the world, and, and multimodally, not just in, uh, uh, so like games and, and video games are multimodal artistic representations. And then I just want to say um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you give up the Luddite quality. So for, for example, Pixar animation is extremely effective because you have the hand animators and then you have this huge data bank of uh, computers rendering that information with, um, you know, every year there's a new generation of um, specialization happening with that um, technology. So, so um, we're constantly moving in between these things and I wonder um, if anyone uh, has been thinking about that um, part of the equation um, and, and certainly uh, ha how does that link back to how we're kind of constantly using this word culture and of course we think uh, of culture not just in terms of, you know, people People who live together in one place, but multimodal representations of thinking about the world that sometimes are in conflict, of course. Great, okay. Um, here and then here, yeah. Actually, let, let's let this gentleman ask first because he hasn't had a question. If we can keep our questions fairly brief so we can get to uh, David Moltz uh, from Inside Higher Ed. Um, I'm, I'm sort of curious about the uh, the three-fourths versus one-fourth split that we sort of see between students who are in sub-baccalaureate programs and those who get the residential experience of a UMish, sort of a you know, flagship state institution, sort of the I'm, I'm going to stay in one place versus I'm, I'm going to learn as I go. Um, I, I'm sort of wondering sort of how, how the institutions of the future fit into uh, career readiness. Um, I do a lot of writing about community colleges and frankly a lot of folks don't really care about uh, whether they can write a sentence or whether they can add two and two. They they, they want a job at the end of the equation. Uh, the reason why a lot of people are drawn to Phoenix is, is they have lots of uh, lots of resources for job placement and career counseling. Um, you, you know, how does that sort of shift what maybe institutions like UMish or sort of international institutions do? Should they be in the career counseling business? Okay, and then this gentleman over here. Uh, I have a very simple question for the panel. Most of you currently represent existing schools. Suppose you are going to start a new school completely from scratch. What is one thing you will do and what is one thing you won't do? If I can get answers from each of the panelists, it will be great. Thank you. Okay, that's a great question. Why don't we start with you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, can, uh, to answer that question, I think the thing that, that I would do is, is look at the path to, uh, to graduation as a, a series of alternatives for students. Is, are they looking at, uh, at more of a, a, a VOTEC perspective? Are they looking at, uh, at a degree? Um, because I think, just as I said, higher education needs to look at, at itself as a set of alternate paths. I think so does the institution now, at least some institutions. Clearly, you know, the, the research one institutions will have a different mission and, and will look at it differently. But I think um, there, there are a set of universities will have to take that into, uh, into account. And the second thing I would do uh, is to realize, and it comes out of what we've been saying today, is this if we talk about online or in the classroom, another thing that we learned from students is they don't care. They want it when they want it in the way they want it. And that experience they expect to be seamless in the same way, again, to go back to the, um, to the shopping or the banking. If I want to go in, I can go in. If I don't, I can do it online. And there are students who, for instance, uh, our students prefer to take math in class because they find it easier in that um, in that way, but there are other classes that they prefer to take online, and we need to make that and the s services that go with it um, much more seamless. So I think that would be the thing I would not do um, is probably invest heavily in facilities uh, because I think facilities usage as we go forward is something that is going to be um, very important to the existence of, uh, of, of some institutions. Yes, well, I may not you know, uh, directly answer your question. Uh, I would like to nevertheless, you know, uh, stress you know, listening to other panelists' you know, presentation uh, with regards to universities of the future. 
I do feel you know, uh, one of the functions I mentioned earlier, namely uh, lifelong learning, uh, takes on uh, more and more importance in the, in the coming years, not only in the context of university, but uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, our, our life. You know, our, uh, we, in the past, you know, tend to think you know, of the end of university education uh, with uh, master's degrees or PhD is, uh, was the end of education, the end of learning. But uh, that belongs to the past. We have to continue to make serious efforts to learn. I'm very glad I have come all the way from Japan to uh, attend you know, th this you know, uh, uh, seminar uh, as a panelist, but also as a learner. I'm learning great deal, frankly speaking. This is uh, you know, part of my you know, lifelong uh, learning, and I'm very sure that applies to all of you. Uh, then, you know, uh, institutions and other uh, uh, organizations do play a very important role and I do hope you know, universities you know, uh, will also make you know, a great you know, contribution to lifelong learning. This is something I would like to pursue uh, further in my uh, thinking, in my uh, research. What kind of you know, uh, role universities can play? And uh, I have been back in Japan only in the last six months, but I do feel Japanese universities are not necessarily fulfilling uh, that role yet. No, yet, in Japan, the overall enrollment of uh, students at universities is fast declining, which means you know, universities must have the capacity, new capacity, uh, to provide you know, uh, learning to university graduate to. Uh, uh, citizens you know, uh, who have uh, completed their university you know, education, uh, but who work, nevertheless, uh, who have the aspiration to uh, continue to learn. That, this is something that Japanese universities should look into uh, more carefully in light of the new development that students' uh, enrollment is fast declining. Thank you very much. Mm. Actually, I got asked a while back if I was interested in becoming president of a college that went bankrupt uh, several years ago and um, they asked me what I would do and I said well probably not whatever it was you were doing five years ago um, <laughs> because you went bankrupt um, so uh, I, I think there's um, a lot to be gained a lot of lessons to be learned from the shakeup that we're now seeing in higher education globally and in you know, including the United States, um, it's a very stressful time for higher education. And I think it's because uh, many of the um, ideas behind the education uh, structure we've created are, um, are no longer as salient as they were at the time they were created. They've, they've been hanging on for various reasons, and, you know, the, the, the salience of them has, has declined. So, um, I, I don't. Um, I mean, I, I told them I really wasn't interested in the job uh, because I don't. I want. I don't want to go start a new university or a new college. But it, it seems to me, if if I were trying to take lessons from what I see right now, the first thing is um, it's it's a it's a ridiculous notion uh, that somehow learning happens in these institutions and it doesn't happen outside. Uh, that's first of all never been true. Um, and it's definitely not true now. And in fact, if anything, more learning can happen, including learning of the kind we used to think we monopolized, outside of the institution, as happens within it. So uh, the boundary between the institution and the world, what we in the academy sometimes call the real world, which is a rather odd way of thinking about the world, um, as though the academy's the unreal world, uh, but that could be part of our problem. Um, you know that 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 boundary would be something I would want to look very carefully at. I I think one of the things that the for-profit private institutions have demonstrated is that um, the the concept of the market for this kind of learning is not constrained to what traditional institutions call the college age demographic. Uh, and in fact, the college age demographic, as we've heard, 
is changing in certain places, in many places, including in the state of Michigan, which is losing population. Uh, so, you know, the, we have to think differently about that. And that, that would be, I think, the primary thing I would, I would focus on. Okay. I just talked about professional education in Japan, but uh, these are just beginning. Actually, in, in Japan, uh, we have not succeeded in uh, graduation, graduate schools. Uh, even compared to China and Korea, our graduate schools are very, very uh, small. And almost all uh, the university ed education are focused on undergraduate level. So uh, the reason Maybe the, the reason is, uh, one of the reasons is that the still Japanese co uh, corporation uh, consists on lifelong employment. They don't need a uh, master degree. And the second reason is uh, the financial issues. Who paid the cost of graduation, graduate schools? Undergraduate level in Japan, the parents pay the cost, the tuition. And uh, as uh, uh, the government, uh, it's a very low uh, level to expand to high, uh, higher education. So uh, in, in, the, uh, in the graduate, uh, graduation, uh, graduate course level, uh, uh, companies don't want to take master level. So uh, even as students can't repay the tuition. So this is uh, two uh, 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 difficulties for, for graduate uh, education in Japan, but I I I believe that I, I told before uh, this uh, uh, this graduation uh, education is uh, very important for the Japanese society. So uh, anyway, we have to uh, create in the very uh, even the small uh, part of uh, of the field we create uh, gradually expanding the graduate uh, courses. That is, that is uh, my uh, university want to try to that. Um, back in the late 1990s, I actually did try and start such a university, uh, the Michigan Virtual University. Uh, I was president of the Michigan Virtual University until I recruited my successor. And the lesson I learned is you should never try to create something like this as a not-for-profit institution because you simply do not have access to the capital markets that you need to really do experiments and so forth. Uh, it did not survive, I might add, so I learned that lesson well. Uh, I'm going to switch tracks just for a moment because, with an apology because I have to get back to the Rust Belt in my state, which is still in free fall with a flight in just a little bit, so I'm going to have to disappear. But what I thought I would do is kind of make a final comment about this particular session this afternoon by uh, reading for you a declaration that a group that I've been involved in uh, co-chairing for a number of years in Switzerland uh, released as a declaration on the state of higher education at the millennium in 2000. Um, I might add that it, most of the language you will hear was written by Frank Rhodes, who was the very eminent uh, president of Cornell University and who was a part of this group. Uh, so I will quote what is called the Gleon Declaration. Uh, to be sure, there will be a continuing need and value for the broader social purpose of the university as a place where both the young and the experienced can acquire not only knowledge and skills, but the values and discipline of an educated mind, so essential to a democracy, an institution that defends and propagates our cultural and intellectual heritage, even while challenging our norms and beliefs, the source of leaders of our governments, commerce, and professions, and where new knowledge is created through research and scholarship and applied through social engagement to serve society. But just as it has in earlier times, the university will have to transform itself once again to serve a radically changing world if it is to sustain these important values and roles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Since, since Dr. Dudersess has to leave, we'll, we'll just say goodbye to you with some of Bye-bye. Thank you very, very Stay much. Stay in touch. We will. We will. <laughs> Maybe we can get the, is that online, that statement? Oh, yes. Yeah, so we can yeah, we'll get the oh, URL. Yes. From the, yeah, okay, great. Um, Dr. King wanted to respond to the question about the arts. The arts, yes, yeah. the arts. Um, so I, I think your point is well taken. There's a, there's a kind of faddishness that hits every aspect of this culture, and, and it hits education as well. And right now there's a 
um, a very strong fad in favor of uh, quantifying skills. And uh, th these fads tend to be somewhat hegemonic, and they often displace, push other things out of the picture. Uh, I'm actually not as despairing of this. I don't think it's a, a, a prolonged uh, circumstance because um, I believe that before too long we're going to see a turnaround in that and there's going to be a resurgence of interest in, um, in nonlinear, less text-based, um, more a, a broader array of kinds of expressive capabilities. The reason I think that's going to be pulled back in is that um, the idea that we are going to improve the quality of education and bring more people into education by narrowing the aperture through which they have to come is crazy. It's actually not doable. Um, and we are either going to have to give up on the idea of inc increased access in order to achieve that objective, or we're going to have to throw the idea of the narrower aperture out. And I think we will do the latter. I think we will relax that constraint. Um, there's lots of reason to believe that uh, there are multiple ways to learn. Um, this is actually increasingly one of the things that, that science of learning is demonstrating. And moreover, there's not just uh, single ways that people learn. They often learn by multiple ways of learning sort of in, in tandem with one another. And so it, it seems to me self-defeating um, not that we won't try this for a while, but it seems to me self-defeating to go too far down the road of saying, well, these are the things that, for example, you know, the insane shibboleth, this is what business will pay for. Business will pay for whatever it thinks is making them money, right? That's not something that's received from God and understood by all businesses to be a uniform set of things, right? I mean, I remember back when I was uh, in computer science at the University of California, and all of the companies, Microsoft, uh, um, Yahoo, uh, um, uh, Apple, and these other companies were recruiting our students. And they were saying, yeah, we don't really care about this computational stuff. We want to know if these people can work together in groups. It's like, well, actually, they did care about the computational stuff. The only reason they weren't caring about it right then was the students actually were pretty good at that. What they were not very good at was working together in groups. So could you put more emphasis on that? Now, if we put all of our emphasis on working in groups and they didn't know how to do computing, they would have brought that up the next time, right? So there's an ecology to these things. And I think that we're in, a, in an era where the ecology is in a, in a bad and, and kind of de depressing place around the arts. But I think it'll turn around. And I'm, I'm hopeful. This ties into your question about vocational education. You want to yeah, jump in on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, do, I don't want to let that get away, David, because I know otherwise you'll... Uh, right tomorrow that we ignored you, uh, and, uh, and we don't want not, that. Not now. only that, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. And it, I think it ties into a in, into a, a set of issues actually that have to do with student success, because right now you know, we look at student success in set uh, in terms of a set of fairly artificial mechanisms like graduation rates, and we look at iPads, we look at placement rates, and I think maybe that's not exactly where we want to be looking. I think we want to be looking at whether or not we're preparing students to be successful and then we're helping them find that pathway to success. So rather than, than focusing on career counseling or placement per se, I think there, there are um, a variety of resources now that we can make available to students. I'm thinking of things like monster.com, jobbing.com, where they can go and explore what's out there. And I think it, what would be more incumbent uh, and something that I think we should look at in the future is providing, for instance, a day in the life of an engineer. Um, and who is likely to become an engineer? We had an interesting discussion at lunch where uh, John was telling us that uh, there was a move to close down um, auto shop classes in Irvine, California. And the actually UC Irvine came and said, no, don't shut down auto shop. That's where our best engineering students come from. They don't come from your cal calculus courses. Now imagine if students in auto shop had the 
had the ability to go out and find out what it's like to be an engineer, find out what, what makes the things that they're playing with in, that, in shop work. I think that is, is a much more productive approach than bringing someone in and saying, all right, you've now taken this set of courses, and so here's the, here's the job we think we can match you with, and, and here's where you go. I think there's a, a, a much broader, way, a broader array of resources that we can bring to those students, regardless of the path they're going to take. Because I think what that example points out is that students don't always know what that path is, but if we can, we can enlighten them, it may help inform how they want to go. Other thoughts on vocational orientation? Or, it would yeah. be nice to have somebody who's not from Phoenix answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have some thoughts about the role of education in preparing students for jobs? What, you didn't like my answer? No, no, no. <laughs> no but no, we wanted to <laughs> I know. You're the one who should be spreading okay. his answer. I, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have a big career placement thing at Michigan. Um, most students don't go there. Um, and I don't know why they don't go there. It may be because it's not very good, uh, or it may be because they don't think they need it, uh, and maybe may that they don't need it. I don't, I don't really know what that what that is. But the but the career. So here's, I had this discussion with the uh, um, some members of the curriculum committee of the big College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, which is the five billion pound gorilla. At Michigan, this is the big university college that has most of the undergraduate students, and um, it was the first time I'd heard the, cra the phrase "creeping professionalism." All right, and this was something that was to be avoided: creeping professionalism. And um, I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, and of course, it was meant about me. Um, so, and, and I was making an argument on behalf of the School of Information, which I was the dean of at the time. And uh, um, there are people in the liberal arts tradition who think that um, if, you, if you get anything useful out of this, we failed, right? Uh, if you can actually apply this to a, a job uh, of, of the kind that somebody would hire you to do, um, and it's very specifically oriented toward the job, it failed. Now, if it's generally oriented toward the job, that's a success, right? How to think critically and do these kinds of things. But it, it, it's, a, it's a cartoon. Um, it's, it's not really where the students are. It's actually not even where most of the faculty members are. It, it's, a kind of, um, it's a kind of position people take around an ideal. And it doesn't seem to me to be borne out, in fact, in the university. For one thing, most of the students in the College of Literature, Science, and Arts are working while they're going to school. So it's not like school and work are two different worlds. For most of these students, it's the same world. It's the world they're living in, right? They're working part-time because it's very expensive to go to school now. And you know, this is a way in which our kind of world is converging, in a sense, with the University of Phoenix world. And you know, we, don't, um, we have these measures, like how many students uh, complete the degree in six years, not, not four years, six years. And, and the number at Michigan is pretty high. But if you look nationally, the number of students, percentage of students who complete the degree in six years has, has been declining. Well, a lot of that's because the students have to work. In some cases, they have to work 30 or 40 hours a week to be able to pay for school. Again, the demographics are converging here. I think there's more things we have in common around this set of issues than, than separate us at this point. Uh, and the thing that separates us is our belief that we're actually in two fundamentally different worlds. And I don't think we are anymore. I mean, that's, that's been the big change I've seen. School and work in Japan? How is that? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, I attend the uh, uh, Japan UK Higher Education Forum in London last uh, uh, February. Uh, there, the main theme is the employability. And uh, uh, UK universities are, are focusing on creating employability for students, uh, especially in the newly uh, uh, universities. Uh, uh, from uh, former Polytech. And uh, now the Japanese universities are, are, are confronting of, uh, uh, difficulties of getting jobs of students. So now, <laughs> also Japanese uh, university and Japanese government try to uh, create employability to <laughs> students. 
So uh, we are trying to some career education in in an in, in undergraduate level, but this is not uh, actually vocational education. Just uh, to create some uh, occupation and employment uh, uh, to uh, ability is uh, uh, actually the uh, same as uh, uh, ability to uh, someone uh, the social. Uh, our citizens and uh, uh, all citizens need such a, uh, such ability like uh, communications and presentation and uh, logical thinking and uh, uh, things that. That is Japanese uh, uh, situation. And actually, uh, companies need such such abilities, not not uh, a direct occupational or vocational ability uh, skills. So uh, it's uh, not so. Uh, 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 contradiction between uh, uh, employability and liberal <coughs> arts. But, but actually, we need some uh, experiences for students <coughs> to what is work, what is job, what is, what is the internship or some, some new area of education, not in a, in a Japanese situation. Do you have yes. some thoughts? Yeah. Yes. Well, the point you have raised is very, very important. Now, it's important in, uh, in all parts of the world. Uh, I said you know, uh, in my presentation uh, in the morning uh, session that in Africa, uh, the university student uh, enrollment is uh, fast growing, fastest in the world. Uh, nevertheless, the overall level of uh, university enrollment is still uh, 5%. I remember you know, whenever you know, we received new requests from African countries to help them create universities, I told my colleagues, you have to examine uh, available job opportunities because uh, even in the fast growing economies in Africa, uh, university students are not likely to get uh, jobs uh, after successful graduation. So it's not good to help them create universities without, you know, without you know, examining uh, future job opportunities. Uh, in many cases, it's more uh, practical, more pragmatic to uh, create you know, tertiary education institute uh, for vocational training or for a professional uh, uh, education. Uh, I have not you know, tried to... You know, um, turn down uh, African countries' request to create uh, universities, I have merely pointed out it's not good to create universities without examining, without you know, carefully examining uh, available job opportunities. In some cases, in, in fact, in many cases, it's more profitable, more pragmatic to create vocational training institutes. Um, I just wanted to inject a note. Um, <coughs> going back to this question of exposing students to job possibilities when i was in when i was a girl many moons ago um uh women didn't most women didn't go on to have jobs and um and the only role models i had were a few female faculty members in the, you know, the university and then the college that i went to and so I became a, a professor myself because that was the only thing I could think of doing. And later I thought, well, there were any number of things I might have done, but I didn't know about them then. I didn't, I didn't know any female doctors. I didn't know any female politicians. I didn't know any female directors of U.S. studies. I mean, I didn't know, you know, I didn't have those role models. So I think that, you know, that the um, opening up the imaginative worlds of people and understanding that just because they, if they have particular um, skills or particular strengths that any number of employment possibilities are open to them, but we don't. We often don't even know about what they are. So I think it's well, not just for women, but for anybody, it's really important. Um, okay, we're going to have one more um, one more question, really, because Dr. Duderstadt was going to answer the last question, but he's really sort of answered it already. So Dr. Pepicello is going to um, answer the penultimate question, and then we'll open it up one more time for your questions, and then we'll uh, have some time for closing statements from the panelists. So will universities become more entrepreneurial? Will they have corporate sponsorship? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you want more? <laughs> well, if you have more to say. Oh, sure. <laughs> I think, oh, yeah. Or maybe you could say what the advantages or disadvantages of that are. <laughs> maybe that would be a way to put it. But I think you, 
there is a move towards uh, entrepreneurism in traditional higher education now, clearly. I mean, Jim talked about Michigan Virtual University, and, and what's interesting is a number of universities, when they have decided they want an online uh, branch, uh, University of Illinois is another good example. Well, it's not a good example, but it's an example. Um, have decided that they would they would try it as a for profit um, enterprise, and and even then it's uh, it's a, it's not as easy as it looks. Um, you know the 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 mechanics of putting together any uh, sort of entrepreneurial for profit arm of of a university involves. Um, a real understanding of the business model. Now here you have a linguistics PhD telling you about business models, um, which I find interesting. But in any event, um, you know, it, it is a, it's a careful investment of not just fiscal resources, but, but human resources. And being an entrepreneurial is not something that one does as, as an add-on. It's not something that you, um, we ask a group of faculty members or administrators, well, well let's build this and see if it, if it works. Um, I think that lesson is being learned. I think uh, increasingly we see that, that universities are, uh, are getting it. They are, um, they are building um, small entrepreneurial for-profit arms. And I see that as a continuing trend uh, going forward. Now that's an internal sort of entrepreneurism. I think there's also going to be a, um, a set of not necessarily corporate sponsorships per se, but I think corporate partnerships. Um, I look at, for instance, uh, partnerships that University of Phoenix has entered into um, with UPS or Walmart or recently the National Association of Manufacturers um, where the goal is not initially to enroll students. The goal is to help some of our, uh, the partners solve problems. Um, so for instance, if an organization is having a problem retaining their employees, and in particular retaining entry level employees, we need to see if as a, an institution of higher education there is an education solution or at least a partial solution that we can bring through education. For instance, if, uh, if an organization um, is having problems retaining um, uh, those uh, entry level folks, could part of the problem be that there is no career path at, at said organization and that the reason that there's no career path is that there's no educational path that would lead those folks so that an organization could grow its own. Uh, leaders for the future, because what happens in uh, in some organizations is that the the management and the executive leadership is brought in from the outside, and there's a constant churn of the uh, of the entry level and, and, and mid management kind of folks. Well, that's not good business, uh, but it's business that we can help if uh, if as higher education in general, not just University of Phoenix. Can, can partner with, uh, with organizations and businesses and, and help provide something that's good for the business, it in turn is, is good for, for the institution who's, who's partnering uh, going forward. So I think that will be uh, uh, something that, that we'll look at uh, very carefully. Um, I think uh, lastly, because um, I want to make sure we have time for, uh, for some discussion on this, I think that we'll also see more institutional partnerships of an entrepreneurial uh, type. I think institutions who have complementary strengths will be able to put together programs and services that will will benefit the student and the institutions together. Um, in, in short, what I what I see happening, I hope, uh, I, I see it in, in at least in bits and pieces now, is that. Institutions are, are looking at each other less as competitors and, and more as, as, as a set of complementary ways that students can achieve what they need to do depending on, uh, on individual student needs. It sort of comes back to that personalization of, of higher education. 
But I think there are a number of, uh, of synergies, and I've, I've talked about three, the internal, the, the business models, and the interinstitutional models, all of which I see as, uh, uh, as much more in an entrepreneurial vein than higher education has, uh, has pursued to this, uh, to this time, that people are beginning to, to realize are not just good for the health of institutions, but are really good for attacking the problems of, 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 the, uh, of the country right now. Could you just give us an example of that last type of the inter-institutional inter kind of partnership? Yeah, we, um, in, in the case of um, some community college systems across the country, and you know, I, I have the greatest ad admiration for community colleges who have the, the broadest mission and, and probably the least funding, uh, and they're impacted. What we're looking for is the opportunity to, um, to help provide uh, services that we might be able to leverage for them, or simply through articulation agreements, uh, help those students, and this is probably more to the point, uh, we have over 800 articulation agreements uh, nationwide so that students will have a path uh, when they get out or if they get into the middle of, uh, of, of their two-year program, um, there's an option for them to, to finish that program by, by coming uh, to University of Phoenix and then either staying or not. I mean, that's the important thing is to keep them in, in the higher education uh, system. Um, and another, uh, another possibility, although this is not something we're pursuing uh, aggressively at the moment, is that uh, in, in many state institutions, uh, the professional or, the, or, or this junior and senior curriculum is, is not impacted particularly. Where state systems are often overwhelmed is in, in the general education. And again, because of our, uh, of our scale, one of the things that, w that we could do, and certainly there are certainly other institutions that could do this, is, is to help fill in the gaps, help make sure that students can get especially good general education courses when they need them so that it doesn't take six years. In fact, we're looking even out eight years now at, at graduation rates for students because what we d discovered is, and this is why I was um, a, a bit critical of iPads, even six years is, is no longer a, a really good measure of whether students complete because they, they, they stop out um, or they, they decelerate, but they're still, they are still students whether or not the, the government uh, chooses to, uh, to count them or not at that time. Did anybody on the panel see any problem with, um, uh, is there, is there any conflict between the values of entrepreneurialism and the traditional values of the university or not? In the Japanese uh, uh, situation, uh, recent, recently the Japanese government uh, uh, permit to uh, create, uh, establish uh, for-profit universities. And actually, a f a few, uh, several universities uh, have been created, but or uh, not succeeded because of the education quality is low, actually low, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, it's, uh, now they are they are going maybe bank bankruptcy. I think uh, they they can't they can't get uh, students free, and the one one reason is that I told before the the Japanese corporation uh, is still. Uh, lifelong and uh, uh, employment system. They then they don't need uh, any degree. Just they they uh, try to freshmen for a graduate uh, uh, graduation from the university. So they they uh, foster their uh, employees to to their uh, staff uh, rank and files. So. Uh, that is uh, uh, still uh, education is not business in Japan. This is uh, just public goods. I mean, quality is certainly right, a right. major mm -hmm. issue, yes. and yeah. and one of the um, I think one of the issues that that I fight on a daily basis is that uh, in general people tend to look at uh, the for-profit sector as a one-size-fits-all, and when people look at 
um, regulatory issues around, around for-profit uh, higher education, they don't tend to differentiate um, beauty schools and truck driving schools from regionally accredited universities. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with uh, beauty schools and truck driving schools, but uh, for the most part, University of Phoenix and other regionally accredited um, universities get lumped in with that within with that group, and we get painted with the with the paintbrush of lack of quality control. When in fact, you know, we have to perform to the same standards as um, as any other regionally accredited institution. Plus the fact that we have to uh, we have to maintain approval in the 43 states um, where we are, each of which is is another sort of third party eye on us and I think but I think that's that's an excellent point is that one does doesn't go out and just start a university without having all, all of the infrastructure in place I just want to make one comment research universities in the United States are essentially franchising organizations um, a faculty member is given a franchise uh, they get to use this the letterhead um, they take advantage of the uh, grants dimensions of the organization they, they they use the facilities and they go out and they and they hustle resources from outside the institution particularly in the sciences engineering and social sciences and fields like that and um, if they don't bring in the resources necessary to get the outputs that they need in order to progress to get tenure they're, they're gone they, they're, they're forced to move on and it's an outputs-based measurement system. Nobody cares how hard you work. Nobody cares about all the inputs you put into the system. They only care about the results. And that's what everything is evaluated on. In fact, it's not the, the publications are actually inputs to the ultimate output, which is was having an effect on the world. And the thing that matters most in the research universities I've been part of are the outside letters that you get from other people who say this person's work has really had an impact on the field. Um, it's also the case in research universities that in certain fields of work, the primary funding has come from industry all along. Mm -hmm. So for example, in chemistry, the primary funding has always been from the private sector. It's never been from government. <laughs> um, it's uh, the chemical industry <laughs> uh, knows what they're doing and they give a lot of money to universities. Business schools, of course, are a, a, are a clear case in point for most uh, you know, institutions. Um, the top 20 or top 30 business schools receive tens of millions of dollars each, each year from companies, and that's where primary uh, funding of research comes from. In fact, most business schools prohibit their faculty members from getting government funding from the National Science Foundation or places like that because they don't want to open their books mm -hmm. to the federal auditors. <laughs> um, so, and not because they're doing anything shady, they just, they just don't want the hassle. Um, so, you know, higher education, particularly elite institutions, are part of the social elite, which includes the elites of business, right? These are all the same people, right? They have lots of interlocking directorates. So this idea that somehow the academy is separated from the world of business and entrepreneurship and so forth, that's never been true in the United States. And that's part of the reason the United States higher education system is strong. <laughs> Is that true in uh, Japan also? Then? No. Funding, funding? <laughs> Completely no. Where does, where does research funding come from? Uh, ma uh, mainly government. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And uh, 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 apart from the uh, private sector, but not so much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. OK, last chance to ask questions. Over here. Yeah, the man in the gray shirt and then the next, yeah. yeah. Please identify yourself. Yes, my name is Gary Bittner. I'm with USAID here in the building. And uh, I really have enjoyed this dialogue throughout this day with not only the audience, but the, the panel itself. And this looking at this area of entrepreneurism, one of the questions uh, I have for the panel is uh, business schools and a lot of universities around the world are pretty well connected to business and industry. And as the gentleman said, the chemistry side is pretty well uh, funded by the, the industry itself. Um, can uh, universities take a look at that 
asset, you know, a business school and how well they're connected and what practices they do and better prepare their students, all their students who graduate with an undergraduate degree with some sort of core courses towards uh, developing their own small business, whether it be social or economic. Um, t to me, it seems like there's an asset there within the institution. Uh, universities have developed research parks which are really connected with business and industry. I think that's what John was, was saying there. And uh, as we work with developing countries around the world, livelihoods is the big issue. Youth, unskilled labor market, uh, and how do they get jobs and, and, and have a livelihood. So we're looking at the role of uh, universities two-year technical schools and vocational schools as well as four-year universities, how can we better prepare all students to get into the work world? That's my question. Did you have, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, I want to add the footnote as there's no Chinese uh, uh, presidents or, or professors here. Uh, I know that in China, most of the research from, uh, funding from government, especially for uh, humanities, like history, which I know, uh, most are the state-funded project, uh, Ministry of Education and uh, the central government, and also state government, uh, uh, provincial government. I have two brief questions for Dr. Pepe Chano again. Uh, the first question is, uh, for an undergraduate student from your university, do they have to fulfill some uh, core requirement in humanity of social science, for example, uh, history, philosophy, and uh, English? Now, second, second question is, uh, would you mind telling us the ratios between full-time faculty and adjunct faculty at your university? Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, back there, yeah. Dr. Hughes. Hi, Kent Hughes here at the Wilson Center. I'd also like to thank the panel and the participants for contributing to everyone's uh, lifelong learning. <laughs> Two quick questions. Uh, in the elite universities, and the better the university, I think this, the more this is so, professors are rewarded for their publications. And the quality of their teaching has nothing to do with their prominence at the university. Yet we've been emphasizing the importance of incorporating new teaching methods, everything from visualiz visualization to online learning. Uh, is there a way that we might change that system? And second, at least in the United States, the cost of higher education has persistently been rising well in advance of the co overall cost of living. Uh, what can we do to control those costs, which in the end are also linked to access? Any last questions? Okay, we'll give, oh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, with all due respect to. Could you almost, identify yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Maureen Bedetti, and I work for uh, the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. And um, I guess my question was whether or not this seminar was directed particularly at universities, because there's been no um, mention. Uh, little mention of community colleges, but certainly no mention of small liberal arts colleges who who by and and, and far have the best the best uh, uh, records of graduating any kind of student, no matter that whether they 're high qualified or they 're minorities or single mothers or whatever and so i 'm very uh, concerned and maybe it was it wasn 't intended to be a comprehensive uh, view um, I also um, notice that in, in your reporting from the iPads that you have put all private colleges together and I think that it's important to distinguish uh, at least in some of, the, some of the fields you did some others where it's private non, not for profit and private uh, for profit uh, as you may n know the the association that represents pri uh, for profit colleges just recently changed their name to include the word um, private um, anyway, the other thing is that, yes, the department is coming out with uh, regulation. They just came out with a notice of proposed rulemaking that um, does not only apply to the for-profit sector, but to, to all sectors. And there is a lot of entrepreneurial um, 
activity going on in, in all the sectors, and um, I think a lot of it, you know, is good. But there are some, you know, as in, as my one philosophy professor taught me in epistemology, you learn certain things, but you lose certain things at the same, at the same time. And uh, we have to be careful with the entrepreneurial um, efforts um, that they don't shortchange students in, in favor of, um, say, stockholder. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those, those questions. Okay, why don't we just proceed across and uh, incorporate these questions and into your final comments, please. Okay, uh, to the last comment, uh, just to be clear, in fact, my first two comments will both go to uh, uh, regionally accredited for-profits being lumped. We are not part of what used to be the Career College Association. We, uh, we are not members, and they do not represent us. Um, to, the, to the question about uh, our general education program, we're regionally accredited like everyone else um, who uh, is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission of the North Central Association. We do have a robust general education program, as, uh, as would uh, the Michigan schools or Ohio schools. Uh, and the, we have about uh, 1,800 full-time faculty across the United States and um, in excess of 24,000 uh, faculty who work for us in, uh, in a less than full-time capacity. Do you want to make some concluding remarks? Okay, uh, and respond not, to any of these questions? Not, uh, not necessarily responding to this. Okay? Whichever, okay. If, they, if you can. Well, uh, I would like to make a very, very brief you know, uh, concluding remarks. I would like to stress once again uh, the importance of uh, lifelong uh, learning and also the importance uh, of universities you know, uh, making contributions uh, to that. I now live in, the, in Japan. I remember. I read you know, uh, in the International Herald Tribune about a month ago uh, that uh, an American woman uh, was graduating from university. I, I don't remember in which state, you know, at the age of uh, 93. Uh, you know, and apparently she did not have a chance to uh, get an you know, university education before, but she decided to go to university, and she finally uh, got it at the age of 93. And I thought you know, she would appear in the Guinness Book, but the report said no, because there was another uh, example uh, of uh, uh, an American lady also, uh, one year uh, older. Uh, she was uh, 94 years old, uh, getting a bachelor's degree, and she proceeded to get master's degree at uh, uh, 95. She appears in the Guinness Book. I, th I think it, it's a very, very good American model. And uh, I still have more than 20 years to go to reach that <laughs> age, but I'm determined to <laughs> pursue a lifelong uh, learning. Uh, and uh, I have learned great deal uh, today, so I'd like to uh, thank once again you know, uh, Kyung Hee University and the Woodrow uh, uh, Wilson uh, Center and for uh, all panelists and also for uh, all participants. Thank you very much. So let me just uh, speak to the issue of quality of teaching in research universities, um, and uh, also the issue of entrepreneurship that was raised by a colleague from AID. Um, so when I was an undergraduate student uh, in the University of California system, I was um, fortunate to be there at the historic occasion when the last known professor who was a horrible teacher but a good researcher was granted tenure. And uh, this teacher subsequently went on to refuse to allow students to fill out teaching evaluations on him for the entire rest of his career. And some years later, I ran into a person who was sort of in charge of this thing. And um, I said, how does this guy get away with this? I mean, why, why don't you do something? And he said, well, you know, Max Planck said that science proceeds funeral by funeral. And uh, when this guy finally retires or dies, uh, he'll be the last one who gets away with that. And uh, this guy retired two years ago, and he was, in fact, the last one to get away with this. Um, as it turns out, there's a direct correlation in research universities between the amount of money that the students or their parents pay for their education and the quality of undergraduate education. Um, I will say in the University of California, which has historically been very low-priced, 
uh, for the students. The, um, the agency relationship between the faculty and the students was um, we pretend to pay them or we pretend to teach them and they pretend to learn. And uh, this was uh, a pretty stable equilibrium that lasted for a long time. Now, of course, the University of California has been raising the tuition rates very rapidly, 30% last year uh, in one, one go. And the students are now starting to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, the quality of my education actually is something I care about. I'm paying this money for it. Faculty are saying, what are you talking about? You're lucky to be here. We're lucky to flunk your ass out of here. And, uh, you know, so this, this cartoon is, is going to play out over the next several years. Now, when I came to Michigan, I was astonished at the degree to which the University of Michigan's attention to undergraduate education was far stronger than the University of California's. Now, the primary reason for this, I think, is that a third of the undergraduates at the University of Michigan are from out of state. And out of state students at the University of Michigan pay three times as much as in-state students do. And you know, you really can't tell whether they're in-state or out of state when you see them walk into class. Now, there is um, what you might call consumer pressure uh, operating. I think it operates in many of the private universities. I know it for sure it operates in the public universities that have large numbers of out-of-state students. Uh, so um, I think the idea that, the, that there isn't attention to undergraduate teaching is, in research universities is, uh, is very uneven. I mean, it's, uh, some of them are, that spend a lot of time, a lot of attention uh, on undergraduate education, some of them don't. And I, again, I, my own view is there's a correlation between out of state and how much they pay um, and whether, they, whether the attention to undergraduate education is significant. Well, one thing I will tell you about Michigan, which is fascinating, there's something called the Arthur Thurnau Professorship that's given at the University of Michigan, and it's only given for undergraduate education. So, and, and you can only get it if you're an, a tenured faculty member. Uh, so, you know, you can't be an undergraduate uh, or, or, or an assistant professor, or non-tenured martyr, and get this thing and get fired. Um, so, uh, this the thing that was fascinating to me about this is that even faculty members who hold endowed chairs always put the Thurnau professorship ahead of the endowed chair name. Uh, and in in a university research university, this is very unusual, right? So this is a sort of a signal that that this reward really matters in the institution. Um, to the point about entrepreneurship, I'll, I'll just make this observation. Um, it's been my experience that the business schools are not good places to turn to for anything having to do with entrepreneurship. And one of the indicators of this is the fact that in American uh, business schools, uh, there are somewhere between 20 and 30 endowed chairs in entrepreneurship that are open at any given time. Uh, because they can't recruit anybody who actually knows something about entrepreneurship who will put up with business school faculty life. <laughs> um, and of course, these chairs are endowed by entrepreneurs who made a lot of money and said, you know, maybe I should give it to this business school and they will train entrepreneurs. The fact is we actually don't know how to train entrepreneurs, uh, just like we don't know how to train leaders. Um, we talk about it, um, but we don't really know how to do it. Um, I think that you're going to see um, a better product of educating students to think entrepreneurially if we go at it from some other direction. And I don't know what that other direction is. I would like to know. I think it would be a very good thing to study. Uh, I know the Kauffman Foundation has been putting a lot of effort into this uh, issue because they're very interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, I think it's a, it's a kind of an, an uncharted frontier in American higher education, and I think it's a huge opportunity. But trust me, if you 17% of all undergraduate degrees granted in the United States are in business. 17%, it's the largest single thing. Uh, those are BBA degrees. Most of those people are not entrepreneurs. They don't go out to become entrepreneurs. Um, at, the, at the graduate level, the elite business schools are primarily graduate institutions. The ones that have small and elite undergraduate programs uh, don't have enough, um, they, they don't affect enough students, right? The, the University of Michigan Ross Business School is a top business school. Uh, their BBA program is 75 students. Their master's degree program is hundreds of students, their MBA program. So they just don't have enough you know, thrust at the undergraduate level. We're going to have to do something differently, I think, than the B schools would facilitate. By the way, my PhD is in administration. OK, uh, I, just one, one thing. Uh, uh, 
Uh, I, I referred about employability before. The, uh, not only Japan, and, uh, including Korea and China, uh, the university and uh, students are uh, suffering from unemployment, getting, uh, cannot get a job. But this is, uh, we have so many, many, many reasons, but uh, one reason I think uh, that uh, uh, these three countries uh, have been catching up, the, uh, introduced to the uh, Humboldt model and American model. So this is, uh, we, we have not seen a uh, look at uh, about the local situation, it, uh, domestic situation. The uh, articulation between schools and uh, uh, workplace is, has some problems. In, in each uh, these these countries, I think we. So uh, my my uh, opinion is that uh, uh, Japan, maybe Korea and China, has to restore uh, the uh, school model uh, in their own model. We have to create Japan model. That is my idea right now. <laughs> Be, uh, to to recover to students to get jobs every student should can be can get job this is my uh, hope it's <laughs> so your university of the future is going to look more entrepreneurial more emphasis on entrepreneurship uh, or on employability or um, uh, so it says important is uh, uh, university is not uh, not so uh, profitable, but uh, students or young people should be more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. That is our uh, educational uh, purpose is an entrepreneurial push. Okay, well, on that note, we've, uh, we've exchanged many, many ideas here today. We've heard a lot, we've learned a lot. Our minds have been stretched uh, in many different directions. This has been an incredibly productive conference. Before I close, I just want to thank my, co my colleagues, Ken Hughes and David Rajewski, who's not here, uh, for helping me plan this conference. Um, I again want to thank Dr. Yersu Kim from Kyung Hee University in Seoul for his idea and his, his inspiration and his cooperation all along. I want to thank our staffs who have been extremely handing out mics and helping you find the food and the literature and so forth. Um, they've been wonderfully uh, helpful all day long. And once again, thank you to our panelists for coming from far and wide uh, to help us with this, uh, to share their ideas and uh, help us explore these really important questions. I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation. Uh, Dr. King asked me before what we were going to do with all of this. We haven't quite figured it out yet, but I hope, stay tuned. You'll be hearing from us. But once again, the um, webcast will be up on our website fairly soon in the next few days, and a summary of the um, conference will also be there. So if you have any questions or anything else, stay in touch. Don't forget to take a copy of the fact sheets that are outside and any other publications you're welcome to. Thank you once again for coming. Thank you.